All right, God bless everybody on Facebook. Uh, t tonight is the Bible study. We got um, David over here as our, one of our students here, and we got his wife as well. And so we're about to get started into the subject of theology proper. So um, the camera's in a weird angle, so, um, but you know what? It'll still work out because you'll still hear them in the background. They might give some input and all. But um, anyways, uh, what's really good about these guys is that um, they are all, <laughs> that was David, they are all about just getting into the Word of God. Nothing about stories, nothing about there's my dog up in Arizona or my mansion in Beverly Hills, 90210. These guys love to study God's Word, so um, we're going to go ahead and get uh, praying, and then let's go ahead and get started. Um, Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you. Lord, your Word is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the minds and the marrows, separating the body from the soul, and, and judging the thoughts and intentions. Lord, as we study your Word today, we just pray that it would penetrate our hearts, penetrate our minds. And Lord, it would be you who receives all glory, honor, and praise as we get into the evidences of God the Father. And I give this all to you in Jesus Christ, we pray, Jesus amen. Christ, amen. 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 So I want to first start off with a testimony um, really quickly. So I, re I remember I was in SDSU with Living Waters, and Living Waters is with uh, Ray Comfort. Easy and Mark Spence, mm -hmm. and so someone challenged me to go talk to this atheist that was hot-headed, mm -hmm. and I'll never forget it. We get into a dialogue, an argument, and he says during the dialogue, "Prove to me that God exists. Who created God?" And I said, "To answer your question, sir, you can't create something that's already existed, and God has existed, and He is the firstborn." of all creation. In other words, he is the first in rank, so you can't create something that already exists. So with that being said, we know that in our world today, we need evidence of who God is. And so tonight, that's what we're going to get into, is the evidences of God the Father. So now let's go ahead and first, uh, oh, are, am I good now? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's first get into the first um, evidence, which is the cosmological evidence. First of all, cosmological evidence. Cosmos. The cosmos, that's right, where we get the, the stars and everything. But I want you to hear what Dr. R.C. Sproul has to say before we get into our scriptures. He says, now quoting... Since every effect must have a cause that started everything, one eternally existing cause set everything in motion, creating effects that then caused other effects that then caused other effects, and so on. This eternally existing cause is God himself. So in other words, when we talk about cosmological, it's an argument from the world to God. How does this world exist because God himself exists. So now let's go ahead and start off in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. First of all, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Because uh, just like in every other truthful story, we need to start from the beginning. How do we know the beginning of the story if we don't start from the beginning? Exactly. So let's go ahead and read from verses 1 to 5. Um, I know we could get into the rest of the book of Genesis chapter 1, but as for time's sake and for getting into the other biblical passages, um, we're just going to go through verses 1 to 5, and then um, we're going to go through two, um, two chapters of the book of Psalms. So let's first start off with Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the day, 
the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was one morning. Now, why is it just these verses? Well, because this is the most criticized verse. These verses, basically. Because number one, there's, call, there's something called the gap theory. And the gap theory basically says, well, it's quite possible that in between these events was probably a process of millions and billions of years. But notice that verse 5 totally demolishes that statement. God called the day the light day and the darkness he called night. And look at this. And there was evening and there was morning one day. It happened all in one day. It couldn't possibly happen through billions and millions of years ago. It happened 24 literal days. I remember uh, my professor Chris Mueller put it like this. Is that a day in the original Greek means day. And night in the original Greek means night. It's a literal day and night. It's a day. How can anybody come up with the conclusion that it's of billions and millions of years? That's because they will you'll talk to some leaders and all, and they say, well, it's possible. But the problem is, if it was possible, then God would have told us right then and there. Hmm. But... Because God doesn't tell us, and it says one day, therefore it is only 24 literal days. So, um, and then there's other people that will believe, well, old creationism, where, where they start to bring some Darwinian evolution theories into this. And they'll say, well, we know that God created man and all, but, which we'll get into the other evidence, but, you know, we, we can go ahead and add on to some Charles Darwinian theories as well. The problem is, is that the same um, person that brought Charles Darwinian evolution is the same person that said that the fetus is just as valuable as a pig. Which goes against what God's word says, because we are created in God's image, which then, um, I don't mean to jump ahead, then you get over to verse 26 and 27, and it says, Then God said, let us make, and notice the, the U is capitalized, which is indicating the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image, capital O, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So this secondly demolishes the evolutionary theory because, as you know, the evolutionists say, well, we came from some sort of fish that evolved over time. But if you notice, it says right here in verse 26, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky. We rule over the birds, the chimpanzees, and all of that. Why we are more valuable than animals. We are more valuable than the trees. We are more valuable than any of those things because we're created in the image of God. So now let's go ahead and uh, go to Psalm 19 verses 1 to 6 because we also need to see that the reason why God created all of this and it also presses forward to the cosmological argument is that everything the reason why God created us, the reason why God created the heavens and the earth, the reason why God created the animals and all of its splendor is because of his glory notice what it says in Psalm chapter 19 verses 1 to 6 the heavens are telling of the glory of God, or in other translations, declaring of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no, there is no speech, 
nor are their words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which, he, which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens or the skies, and its current to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. In other words, it is saying that God created the sun for his glory. God created all of this. And it even says in verse 1, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Even the things that he's expanding is to his glory and to his honor. The reason why we are created is for his glory and for his honor. This is why the, the Westminster Confession says this, is that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So that's why now we can enjoy him. And then, even more fantastically, look at the description in verse 5 about how after it says that he placed the sun like a tent, it says, which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber and it rejoices as a strong man to run its course. In other words, um, the difference between an American wedding and a Jewish wedding is this, is that instead of um, them waiting for the bride to come out, it's the husband coming out. So in the same exact way, we wait for the sun to come out, S-U-N, so that we can behold the glory of God and all of its creation then also one last one for the cosmological argument of God the Father is Psalm 104 verses 1 to 8 Psalm 104 verses 1 to 8 um, and we could go forth more but as I said before and I'll say it again is that um, we want to make sure we're good on timing because we agreed from 532, 630, because I don't want to be disrespectful of anybody's time. But if we could, we can go for hours in this subject. But of course, we have other stuff that we have to cover on the evidences of God the Father. So let's go ahead and read from verses 1 to 8. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. Kind of sounds like the previous passage we just read, right? That he places the sun in a tent. And not only that, he stretches out a tent like a tent curtain. Notice that. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the winds his ministers of flame, uh, flaming fire his ministers. He established the earth upon its foundation so that it will not totter or tilt forever and ever. You covered it with a deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurled away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. So you see, the Psalm 104 kind of has the same pattern as Psalm 19 verse 1 because it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed in splendor and majesty. And we kind of see that in um, Psalm 19, verse 1, that the heavens declare the glory of God. So in a same similar spectrum, this is glorifying God because he's clothed in splendor. And Psalm 19, ver Psalm 19 verse 1 is glorifying God because the heavens or the skies declare his glory. And so you see also that he lays the beam, or actually verse 2, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. In other words, when you see back in Genesis 1 and, and, and also in, again in Genesis 1 about how he expands, he expanded the skies, he expanded the waters, and no.
notice it says like a tent curve curtain. It's like as if you were going camping and you know you extended it wide so you could have privacy. Well, almost in the same similar matter, God stretched open the, the skies. So then it shows his true glorious works of how he created everything. And then he, he makes the winds, his ministers, flame, flaming fire, his ministers. Um, basically also some people say that that's uh, referring to uh, the attributes of the angels. So not only is he creating everything, but he's also using his angels in the midst of all of that. Because why he is, um, he's above all and he knows all. And notice it says in verse 5, he established or set forth the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter or it won't, um, it won't go back and forth. It's like what we use for this background for the, uh, what is it called? The camera, you know, we were testing it to see, um, you know, that it, it wouldn't falter. Well, it's the same idea here, that it would not totter forever and ever. Why? Back, back in the first part of verse 5, he established. The reason why the earth exists is because God established it. The reason why we exist is because God established it. And the reason why the birds fly to his command is because God established it. Every single thing of creation is established by God and God himself. Amen. Amen. Now, secondly, let's go ahead and go to the second argument. The second argument is teleological. Teleological. Let me go ahead and spell it out because it's a, we're getting into some big words, but uh, it'll help us to learn to use these words properly. So T-E-L-E-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, teleological, teleological, and this is what it means. The argument for the existence of God from the evidence of order and hence design in nature and relating to the doctrine of design and purpose in the material world. So it's not only from the world to God, but it's also now universe to God. Or in this way, design of universe demands a designer. So why is it that our universe exists? Why is it all these things? It's because God made them to exist. That's why. And um, really quickly, remember the arguments that God had with Job. When Remember, and Job was complaining a lot. Well, you go back to Job chapter 38. And notice, from verses 1 to 7, and listen to how God responds to him. Because, uh, you know, Job went through a lot of suffering, and Job means in the original Hebrew, means the persecuted one. So that's why he went through all this, but it was to show this. Now, why does Job relate to Christ? Well, just as Christ was persecuted by his people, so, Christ, so, um, so, so it's a picture of Christ being persecuted for us. But I could get more into that, but uh, to stick with the subject, um, we're going to go ahead and stick with Job chapter 38, verses 1 to 7. And, and notice this, Job chapter 38, verses 1 to 7. Then the Lord answered Job out of, a, out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Are you arrogant man? Now gird up your loins like a man. And I will ask you, and you instruct me, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who sets its measurements? Since you know, it's basically a sarcastic way of saying, well, since you know, our rhetorical question, or who stretched the line on it? 
on what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Notice that, that basically God is telling Job, where were you before I created the world? Where were you before I created the evidence? And I, and I really believe that this right here is such a good argument for an atheist. We should ask him, where were you before God created the world? If you say that the world is billions and millions of years old, where were you at that time? If you can prove this, and they'll say, "Well, um, you know, we're, we're just we're just going with the we're just going with the uh, uh, the experts." Oh, okay. So that means to tell me that you're placing your faith and trust in the experts. Oh, no, 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 no. Then their other argument is, well, well, you know, we, we don't have faith. We have what's called confidence. Well, what we need to remind them is that, well, confidence comes from the, orig- from the Latin word, confides. And this word means with faith. So what you're telling us then is you still have with trust with the experts. You still have trust. And so, and notice also going on to say is that now grind up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you will instruct me. In other words, God is asking another argument. Well, since you know all these things, will instruct me. But as we know, I'll quote it really quickly. In Romans chapter 11, no, in Romans chapter 9, it says that who can counsel the Lord? In other words, who can teach God? And of course, the overwhelming answer to that is nobody. Nobody can teach God. We can give him a, we can give our prayer request. We know that in Philippians chapter four, verse six to seven, that um, let's, and be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. So the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean we teach God. We just give God's, we just give God our needs and our requests to Him. And why is it that we worship him? Not because he needs to be, uh, not because um, he needs the worship, rather because we need to worship him. Amen. So, and notice in verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And then going on, you who stretched the line on it, or what were its bases sunk? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons shout, uh, of God shouted for joy. In other words, where were you when all of these things happened? Where were you when I designed everything and the universe? Now, not only does this passage make known about the stars, but also if we go to Psalm 8.3, also talks about how he counts the stars and how he numbers them. So Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. Actually, let's even start off in verse 1 and go down to verse 3. And so, Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. So Psalm, and are you guys there yet? Psalm mm-hmm. chapter yep. yes. All right, let's do it. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. But notice verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. 
notice the beautiful language in that, that after you see the majestic glory of God and how it's displayed, and doesn't it, isn't it what we saw back in Psalm 19, verse 1? You see what's going on here? This is why you study systematic theology, to have a con consistent biblical worldview. Because you see the same things being repeated over and over again. We saw this back in Psalm 19, verse 1. We saw this in Psalm 104, verses 1 to 7, and in Job 38. But notice this, is that when, after, you, after you get into, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy of the revengeful cause. Notice that verse 3, when I consider your heavens, when I consider your skies. And if you want to know why the clouds are in such a beautiful formation, why is it that the sun is in such a perfect place? It's because of this, of the second part, the work of your fingers, the work of your hands, the work of your fingers. And notice the rest of it. The moon and the stars which you have ordained or numbered. So that's why we have Big Dipper. That's why we have Jupiter, Mars, Venus, all of these planets. They all exist. They all stay together because God ordained them to stay together. It's because God made the sun, and by the way, if you study the science of the sun, the sun, as we saw even back in, I believe it was Psalm 104, or, or um, Psalm um, yeah, 147, that nobody can escape its heat. So, and it goes on to say that um, in science that the sun is 24 Point seven million degrees hot. That right there in the word of God just made it very well clear that it gave evidence and the power of who God is. Not, not only that, but by the work of his fingers, the work of like his fingers. Like a potter in clay to where is God doesn't dwell within his own existence. It dwells in him. It, oh, yeah, it, right. The existence doesn't yes. dwell. He doesn't dwell in something he created with his fingers. It dwells, it dwells within. That's, yeah. God is spirit. That's right. And we're going to get into that, how God is spirit and everything. And that's such a good point because you see um, both in Isaiah and Romans 9, that he, it says that he is the potter, we are the clay. So that's why he forms it by his his fingers his hands so not only does he has ordained the 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 sun and the moon and the stars and all that but he has ordained us to live <laughs> isn't that amazing i know i'm, I'm getting very excited so uh yeah. it's really great so um and now because of all this then go to verse 9 as well actually to even make um, even more awesome, let's go ahead and, um, and by the way, have you noticed something th throughout this whole context? This is all also, if you ever take the chance to, and we don't have time, but whenever you take the time, go through this whole chapter and you'll notice it's all about Christ. Um, just, uh, just, uh, what is it? Just in case you're wondering, well, how is this about Christ? Well, verse 4. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Who is he talking about? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crowned him with glory and majesty. This is Christ, the Lord. So not only is he talking about God as creator, but he's also talking about Christ as Lord. So now let's go ahead and do verses 8, no, yeah, 8 and 9. That even though verse 6 talks about putting all things under his feet, because if you even go to Psalm 110, verse 1, that it talks about that 
he will put everything subjection under his footstool, which talks about the kingship of Jesus Christ, which I actually did a sermon on through the whole Psalm 110, so hopefully we can get into that sometime. But anyways, going back on to this, notice in verses 8 to 9, the birds of the heavens, the skies, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the pass of the seas. Or in other words, this is him talking about that even this is under the authority of his feet. Now, verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What an amazing reality of God this is. That not only we have evidence that the world is created from God, but the universe itself is the existence that God exists as well. Now, thirdly, and lastly, the anthropological evidence. Let me spell that out real quickly. A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-I-C-A. And this is what it means, is that man's unique intellectual, emotional, social, moral, and spiritual nature infers a maker of at least same characteristics. What do I mean by this? Is because we exist, God exists. Why do we hate evil? And why do we have a conscience? Because God gave that conscience. We hate, and especially those that have the Holy Spirit and hate sin now. And now that the Spirit dwells in us, now it gives us the desire to hate sin. It's because God hates sin. So, but first of all, let's start off that we are created in what's called in the Latin, the Amongo Dei, which means... We are created in the image of God himself. So let's go back, of course. We read this before, but let's go ahead to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. That's right. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. All right, sweet. Okay, let's go ahead and do it. And uh, so after, of course, God made the beasts of the earth and after their kind and all that. Then we see in verse 26 about how God created male and female. Notice, then God said, let us... Make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and all and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be for you. So, notice this is that when you come to verse 26, it reminds us of the awesome reality that we are created in the image of the triune God. It's not just talking about God the Father. It's not just talking about God the Son. It's not just talking about God the Holy Spirit, but the Trinity in itself. Because it says us. Us is plural. Because you don't go... Well, it's just going to be us. But really, I just mean it to be just me. That wouldn't make any sense. That's not logical. What makes more logical sense is that this is 
the Trinity, that we are made in the image of the triune God, and then it goes on to say, in our likeness, in his ways, or and, we're, and later on when we get into the study of God the Father, we're also going to get into what's called the communable attributes of God, which means of attributes that God shares with us. And we're going to make some distinctions on love and grace and mercy and patience and so on and so forth. But tonight we're just going to focus on the anthropological argument. And, so, and then notice, it, it repeats it again. This is called Hebrew parallelism, where it repeats a phrase on top of another. It's, it's, it's um, basically um, repeating this truth that we are created by God. Because it says back there that let us make man in our image. In verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Notice, it's repeating over and over again. Male and female, he created them. It's the importance of God creating us. Now, it's not only the importance that God has created us, but notice, verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Um, this is why um, we can have a happy marriage. This is why, because God has um, commanded us. And of course, that's why you get into the book of Hebrews and it says that keep the marriage bed undefiled. Why? Because if we, go, if we have a relationship outside of our marriage bed, it goes against God's created order. That's why it's not just the fact that it's pornophilia or pornea, which we get the term for pornography or sexual immorality. And it's not just that, but if we sin against the Almighty God in our marriages when in another relationship, we are actually sinning against the created order. Why? Because God made sex specifically for marriage. Because that's how he created it in the beginning. And that's why I even want to go on to say when we get into this argument of trans... Uh, transgenderism and um, and gay and lesbianism I don't mean to use such explicit language but when we get into these things we have to point them back to this that because God created us male and female there is no room for a transsexual or transgender there is no room for it because God created us male and female because God said it, and only God said it, but it's a reality. Just That's probably what the nurse says when she pulls the kid out. It's a boy. Exactly. <laughs> it's a girl. It's a girl. <laughs> because if, and if you notice, let's even take this to a practical realm. Uh -huh. That when you sign out a job application, there's not male, female, whatever you feel like. No, it's male, female. And that's how it's always been. Why? Because God has already ordained it. ordained it, established it. So therefore, to say that there's billions upon millions of genders is idiocracy. It is stupidity at the maximum level. It's not reality. It's not reality. It's not. It's idiocracy. Yes, and so notice, going on to say, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. We rule over the fish in the sea. And if you go even to Genesis 2, well, I'm not going to open it up, but really quickly, you remember what Adam does. He names the creatures. And really quickly, here's the reality of that. Now we can name our dog a name. We can name our fish a name. Why? Because of that reality. We rule over the fish. We rule over the dogs. We rule over everything. That's why 
we hunt and kill animals. Now, of course, we have to be careful with that. We don't, we're not saying that we abuse dogs or we abuse cats or we abuse lions, but rather we can survive off of cow meat and, um, and uh, pig meat and all that because God gave all that to us. And notice, that's what we see in verse 29. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has yield, yielding seed, it shall be food for you. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we can eat a cheeseburger? Because it, because it shows off the goodness of God. Now, of course, we have to be careful not to be glutens, but at the same time, we can enjoy food because of the goodness of God. We can enjoy another day outside because of the goodness of God. Because notice, if you go through Genesis 1, you'll notice it says, it is good, and it was good, it was good. Or in, let's make it even more of an emphasis. That in the original Hebrew it says, it is the best. It is the best. It is the best. So when God created the heavens and the earth, it wasn't just it was good. It was the best. God created the best. Hmm. Amazing. What an amazing, astounding measure of truth. Now, Secondly, now let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Because not only are we created in the image of God, but notice he created us from the dust. We know the old saying that um, from dust you come, shall dust you shall return. Well, this is where that saying comes from in this passage. And also you get to other passages where basically says that God knows that they are just but dust. This is exactly why. Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Amazing. And, and I remember Carl Sagan was even saying this, and he is an atheist. When he was alive, he said this, notice, is that we are nothing but stardust. You did. In a sense, that is true, only to the extent that without the breath of God, we are dead. We are stardust in the sense that we are from the ground, but we're not just stardust in the crowd. We are made alive because of God. Notice verse 7. Um, man, the Lord God formed man from dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. We are living human beings. And that's why if you read the Puritans and watch the, the preacher Paul Washer, they say over and over again, you cannot even breathe without the power of God in your life. This is why he puts every breath in us. We can sleep because of God. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can enjoy every breath. We can enjoy every yawn. We can enjoy every kiss from a loved one because of the power of God. Oh, are we, are we going um, no, over time? Okay. You can go as long as you like. <laughs> well, I think... I think to uh, now let's go to our last Bible passage is in Psalm 139. 139. Psalm 139, verse. 
Yes, exactly. But when, when we get into its full entirety, it's going to be an amazing reality because we all know the, the part where it says, um, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But when you read the full context, this is actually talking about God's omnipresence and omniscience. So that means God's omnipresence means he's everywhere. We know it because omni, Greek, means every presence everywhere. Then omni, everywhere, I mean, um, omni, science, omni, all, science, knowledge. No, science is basically knowledge. Knowledge about how our world works, knowledge about the, how the body works. With knowledge. With knowledge. Exactly. So, let's start off in verse 8 because, check this out. You've heard it said that, you know, hell is a separation between God and man. However, when you get to verse 8, God is also in hell. Well, why is that? It's because it's, it's his divine wrath upon unbelievers. And for more evidence of that, you can also go to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, when There's you have no time. You can hide. There's nowhere you can hide. And even, even Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 makes very clear that no, no hidden creature is hidden from his sight. All will, be, will, will lay bare to those according to what we have to give an account to. In other words, we are accountable to God for all of our actions and deeds. So anyways, let's start off in verse 8. And, and on verse 14, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Shiloh, hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even, you'll, <clears throat> even your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not night to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Well, why is this? Notice verses 13 to 14. Well, let's even go on to verse 16. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. But notice, verses 15 to 16 going on. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and, or, the, or the womb of a mother and skillfully wrought or brought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book are all written the days that were ordained for me. There's that word again, ordained, established. Um, uh, were ordained for me when as yet they, there was not one of them. Amazing. So why does it have to do with omnipresence and um, omniscience? Well, notice from when we looked at verse 8, omnipresence, because God is in both heaven and hell. In, in a sense, because here's the thing, we have to make a category distinction. That yes, sin separates us from God, but here's what it separates us from. His, his eternal love, his eternal grace, and his eternal mercy. That's what we're really separated from. But if you're not in Christ, guess what? You're not separated from him in the fact of his wrath and justice upon you. So we have to make those clear category distinctions when we talk about being separated from God, because then it goes against scripture when we say, well, we're just separated from God altogether. And somehow Satan is on the throne of hell and he's just, you know, working hell together. That's not what the Bible teaches. Mm. The Bible teaches God is over Satan. Mm. And whatever God tells Satan to do, Satan does at his command. Amen. So that God doesn't save us. Jesus doesn't save us from Satan. He saves us from God. 
Exactly. He might turn you over to Satan. Right. And that's such a good point because, um, because if you really you think about it, it's... exactly. And it, when you get into Romans one, even how God gave them over to lustful passions, everything it's to show His wrath. So let's go on to say, "But take the wings of the dawn. If I dwell in the remote part of the sea, even your hand will lead me." And it's saying that even. No matter how far out we go from God, His hand still guides us. We can go all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast. His hand still will guide us. We can go to the moon, the Mars, any planet. His hand is still there to guide us. Right hand refers to God's guidance. I mean, if you get into the Word of God and you notice that says His right hand will guide me, hand will guide me, right hand will guide me, is to show God's guidance and provision. And your right hand again will lay hold of me. So not only will it lead us, but it will hold us. That's why when you go into John chapter 6 about that whoever... The, whoever the Son gives to the Father, He will no way cast out because of this reality. And your right hand will lay hold of me. And to that we say yes, please, and amen. Amen to that. <laughs> and then, of course, then to make it really quickly, because I know we have to get going, so He goes on to say from verses 11 to... Um, to basically to uh, uh, 16 about the the womb and all that but notice also verse 16 your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me established for me when as yet there was not any of them in other words what is basically communicating is that even before God saw us God already planned that we would be formed in our mother's womb mm. before we would even walk on this earth that our hands would be put in place our fingers would be put in our place our fingernails would be put in place our eyebrows would be put into place and basically this is what John MacArthur has to say about your book just in case of what does it mean by your book listen to what John MacArthur has to say of this this figure of speech likens God's mind to a book of remembrance. Not, a, not one of them. God's sovereignty ordained David's life before he was even conceived. So the book is basically like, you know how you look in your, um, your family book and how like, oh, I remember that, I remember that, I remember that. It was as if God has known us for a long time looking at a family book portrait. That's how well he knows us. But not only that, that's not even, even a great reality. The greatest reality is he knows our insides because he formed our inward parts. And now because of that, we can say, as verse 14 makes very declaring, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. This is our God. This is our Creator. In Him we have been made. The world exists because God made it to exist. The reason why the universe exists is because God ordained it to exist. And why do we exist? Because God ordained us to exist exist and now we are held we are held preciously in his hands of sovereign grace let us pray heavenly father amazing you are you are master and lord and creator and father lord because of you we exist we are created and now help us to glorify you mm -hmm. throughout all of our lives, God. So then, Lord, we can um, 
just exalt your holy name now and forevermore. Christ, help us to not belittle you. Christ, help us to not take glory for what you ought to take glory in. Father, now we just praise you and, and say, as Psalm 19 verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The handiwork is in the dome of the earth. Lord, remind us that we are created by your hands of sovereign grace. So then we can glorify Christ all the more. In his precious name we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. I hope you guys enjoyed this Tuesday night Bible study. And uh, David and the sweet dear wife, go ahead and say goodbye to our fans. Our, I, not, I know bless. me fans. God bless. God bless. <laughs>